This verse is very profound. I read Ephesians 1.13. In whom he also trusted, after that he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that he believed, he were sealed with that, with that Holy Spirit of promise. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy word. In giving these notes, we find the salvation is so great because the triune God is involved in it. As we read there, the greatness of our salvation is seen in the effectual working of the triune God. We see God the Father is planning, God the Son is perfecting, and God the Holy Spirit is personalizing in the life of every repentant sinner, trusting in the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what a joy it is for you and me to testify to that great work of God in our life as well. Because when we consider these verses, we find the ruin sin has brought in one's life, the rule of sin that binds a person and the result of sin bringing eternal damnation and there is absolutely no hope for any. But the scripture says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What a salvation and what a gift. In verse 8, Apostle Paul uses three words, grace, faith and saved or salvation. These three go hand in hand. If you have grace, then you have faith and salvation. If you have faith, then you have grace and salvation. How good it will be if you and I, when consider our ruin in sin, but comprehend the gift of grace in the Lord Jesus. Because salvation is a gift of God by grace alone, by faith alone, and in Christ alone. It encompasses my past, my present, and my future. It is deliverance once and for all from penalty of sin in the past, from the power of sin in the present, and one day from the presence of sin in the future. When we read this passage of scripture, we understand salvation is something which belongs to God alone. And the first reference in the Bible, Genesis chapter 49 and verse 18 says, I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. And the law of first mention teaches us that it is the unique property of God alone and it is reiterated by men and women of God. As you see in the list given there, Jonah said, salvation is of the Lord. David said, salvation belongs to the Lord. Psalm 3 and verse 8. Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Exodus 14 and verse 13. Simeon said, when he took the baby Jesus in his hand, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Luke's Gospel chapter 2 and verse 30. Then we read in the words of Mary, my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Dear brothers and sisters, this salvation is something that God has purposed. God provides, God performs, God brings to perfection and God will have the praise ultimately. It is altogether God's plan. And this workshop we want to consider just three things as we open up this scripture. The beginning of our great salvation, Secondly, the beauty of our great salvation. Thirdly, the blessings of our great salvation. At the end, actually, I would like to say this words which are written there in the notes for you. God thought it. Christ Jesus bought it. The Holy Spirit wrought it. The Bible taught it. Faith brought it. The devil fought it. But thank God, I have got it. Isn't it something great? And when I consider this very important subject of salvation. Let us focus our attention. You know why? Because if there is no salvation, anything else that one person will try to live and do in this world will be of no use. If one is not really saved, genuinely saved, reconciled to God, born again and not forgiven of his sin, whatever they try to do thereafter, it, it will be only a mimicry. It will be only a copying of things and trying to live a life of a saved person. And we see there are actually too many who are struggling to live a life of a believer. You can see that. They might have heard the gospel. They might have known the things of God. 
But if the salvation is not genuine, these days, especially when I spend my time with the younger generation, the youth, and also with the kids, you and I have to be really very careful. If we are not careful on this aspect, we are leading these children or the youth or the next generation to something which they will miss eternally, eternally. Because we are living in the days today, we call it soap soup salvation. Yeah? Raise your hand and you are born again. Sign up a sheet and you know the Lord Jesus. You say a prayer after me and you are saved. All these things and methods which are going on around us, we have to be really careful. I am so much thinking on this subject very much these days when I think of the children and the youth very specially. Not want to just talk to them about the aspect of salvation, but want to consider the assurance of salvation. How many children today, we wonder why they do not have interest in the things of God. You and I desire them to do, but you know, how many parents have done a great mistake or leaders in the assembly have done a great mistake in not focusing upon this very important aspect by saying to the child at home, come on, their daughter has accepted the Lord, what about you? Their son is baptized, what about you? So because somebody else has accepted the Lord, this child is forced to say and the child may sometimes say it off. The child may get even baptized, but you know what will happen? You and I will be responsible to lead them in a wrong way. How parents should be really having tears in their eyes, prayer on their knees. Lord, save my child. Save the children of our assembly, the children that we come across. I'm talking about children, you know, because that's the next generation. And we see things are really waning, passing, you know, having not that real genuineness in them. Why? Because salvation is not understood properly. That's why I want to draw your attention this afternoon to this very important basic subject of salvation. And did you notice Apostle Paul? Chapter 1, 2, 3 in this Ephesians actually is talking about doctrines we were talking repeatedly in all classes. But when he talks about this doctrinal aspect in first three chapters, which is the first one he's touching on? He's touching on the aspect of salvation. Because he wants those believers to know what great work of salvation God has done in your life. And that's why chapter 2, well then you got to be living a life of separation, a life of sanctification. Chapter 3, then you got to have the mind of Christ, you got to have mind of a saint and you must know the mind of a sinner. He talks about three minds in chapter 3. And then he says in chapter 4 and verse 1, therefore brethren, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling that you have. My dear brothers and sisters, though this is a very important subject, but it's a neglected subject. And because it is a neglected subject, that will have really adverse effect if we are not mindful and careful about this. So may, may I take your attention to this very important subject and first of all we'll see the beginning of our salvation, then we'll consider the beauty of our salvation and then we'll also see the blessings of our salvation. It is just great. Did you see? Out of these verses of chapter 1, we should be reading from verse 3 to verse 14, but we have read only one verse, verse 13. And that verse is a profound verse. It encompasses all aspect of salvation, the beginning of salvation. Now, since this is a workshop, you are most welcome to contribute your thoughts, which will be an encouragement to all of us. You can ask a question, you can share a thought, you can share your um, devotion or whatever the Spirit of God brings to your attention as well. As we discuss it and learn this very important aspect, salvation. The beginning of our salvation, let's focus on it first of all. My question. May I bring a... Please. I, am I allowed to? Uh, my child, yes, he's uh, here, I'm going to express that. Noah, uh, whom you saw, uh, I, the Spirit of God was upon me by the grace of God, and I, I, I thought I led him to the Lord, you know, mm -hmm. his brother was with me when we were discussing that, mm -hmm. and he was five and a half or something, but recently when we were at this um, another meeting, 
and the uh, altar call was given and uh, he said Dada I'm not sure what I'm saying mm -hmm. and uh, we were at this mega church and he was really convicted mm -hmm. of the message well and he's, he was then his brother next to me said mm -hmm. what's going on and he said I said no one wants to go forward and Jeremy was trying to talk him out of it I said mm -hmm. Babe, Jeremy, Noah, I was there. I was there when you got saved. No, mm -hmm. no doubt. Mm -hmm. this, this, that. So there was this conflict, you know, between the brothers and me and the uh, father. And it was a mega church. I had a long walk. Oh. You know, this was the mother church of uh, Billy Graham. So it was like a huge church. Oh. Ten minute walk to the altar. Okay, okay. I just prayed, uh, cried out to the Lord, Lord, if this child truly accepted you at the age of five, just do a miracle that he I don't want my child to doubt that he was never saved mm -hmm. you know I mean you can go through that I phases can, of yeah. saved today not saved today you know I mean mm -hmm. you know that can devil mm -hmm. can use that very much that. Yeah, yeah so just I, I just cried out to the Lord as I was walking behind him from a distance well he went to the altar and this gentleman you know kind of walked towards me and I kind of gestured and said you know can you go and minister to him so he came back to him and said are you the father of no I said yes he said Oh, I just reassured to him that the salvation that he received. <laughs> so emotional for me. At five years old, you haven't lost it and just walk in, in faith. And I, I was like, wow, God, you answered my prayer because I didn't want my child to think that, you know, nine and a half, he lost what he received. At the same time, you know, that's the God we, you and me serve. You Praise know? God for yeah. that. Yeah. What an incident, you see. We can't doubt the working of God for sure. Yeah, God can do miraculously. He can touch. Brother, what you said is true with b both of my children. At a very young age, well, we were very particular to take them to the assembly. Very particular. What may happen? Homework, schoolwork, classwork, tuitions. What may happen? Assembly meetings, never to skip. That is a practice. As, as the, both of them were very young not even entered in their teens and taken to the assembly. That day they hear a powerful gospel message preached by another brother in our assembly. They come back home and I was on itinerary on some, some other place. They come back and talk to mom and say, Mom, am I really born again? How should I be born again? If what uncle said today according to Bible is true, Mom, I'm not going to heaven and I want to accept the Lord Jesus. Mom at home just explained the things to the children. Both of them knelt down and said, Lord, I am a sinner. Please forgive me. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Come into my heart. And by God's grace, I tell you, for the glory of God, both of them growing in the Lord and standing good witnesses wherever the Lord has kept. The Lord can surely do that. Mm -hmm. There is no doubt in it. May I draw your attention to this very important subject because the salvation aspect, as I said, is really to be understood what exactly it is. So my first question when I think about the beginning of our salvation, my first question is this. What do you mean when you say you are saved? What really happens to a person when he or she says, I am born again, I am saved? What happens to the person? Because before coming to the Lord, and after having believed in the Lord or having come to the Lord, is there any difference in that person as far as his physical structure is concerned or his lifestyle is concerned, at that age is concerned? So my simple question is, what do you mean by being saved? Can you contribute something to that? Transformation takes place. Transformation takes place. Anything else? You get the assurance of peace. Assurance of? Peace. Peace. Anything else? What do you mean by being saved? Now you and I have known the Lord. New creature. You have become a new creation. Creation. Anything else? Whatever. It's a process, you know. To me, you know, the one, the one scripture comes to my mind is, "Work out your salvation." Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying getting saved is a process, but you know, like in my children's case, you know, I had that tendency to brother be judgmental about the younger generation saying, mm -hmm. oh, just because they truly prayed mm -hmm. and my ministries to the younger mm -hmm. group too. I was judging 
based on the fruits, mm -hmm. whether they're truly saved mm -hmm. or not. And I don't have that right to judge. Mm -hmm. Of course, God can judge. Correct. So we just need to, like I was doing, cried out to the Lord, even mm -hmm. truly. And we need to be in these kid children's life. Mm -hmm. You know, you and me interceding on their behalf Very to true. make sure and praying yeah. and making relationship to yeah. make sure that you know either you're watering or planting your seed. You know I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. Yeah. yeah, of course. The day we are born again, we are just a babe, you know. So we don't understand the whole world about salvation. But as we grow in the Lord, we understand what salvation is. Because doctrine of salvation itself has many facets, many aspects into it. Like when you say one is being saved, he is justified, he is sanctified, he is glorified. But between all these things, you know, he is also elected, he is also predestined. Well, then he is also adopted. And that when you consider all these aspects or facets of salvation, the salvation becomes so beautiful for us. I will come to that. But my question is, when you say you are born again, you are saved, what really exactly happens to a person? How can we talk to a person that you are born again or you are saved? Or what has exactly happened to that person? Like we heard in the first message by Ben Matthew, we walk not as the world. Okay. You change your character, your contact. Mm -hmm. And everything becomes new. Mm -hmm. You become a new creature, like uh, Brother said. No, my question actually is this. Uh, when you say you are saved, what happens to one? How can we explain to somebody okay. uh, that this is what salvation is? This is how salvation takes place. What exactly happens to us? Now, all that you have contributed, thank you for that. Well, it's a forgiveness of sin then it is reconciliation with God. It is becoming a child of God. It is turning to God. It is no more condemnation and judgment upon us. All that is good. But what exactly happens? Now, who needs the salvation? Maybe that will be a better question. The peace we get. Who needs the salvation? The peace we get. A sinner needs the salvation. But when then I go to a person on the roadside and say, Hi, hello, how are you, sinner? What will he do to me? <laughs> well, how, how dare are you to call me a sinner? Right. So how do we make that sin aspect known to them? Because unless the sin aspect or sinner aspect is made known to somebody, there is no need of salvation for them, you know? Yeah. So how, what do you mean by a sinner? Let us define sinner. What do you think? Who could be a sinner? Whom should we call a sinner? Everybody's a sinner means what? We are all sinners, Romans 3.23, I also believe that. But how do we tell to a person or know for ourselves that one is a sinner? A sinner, in the, according to the word of God, is who, how, what? What kind of sinner is sinner in the Bible? When does a person become a sinner? How does a person become a sinner? We are born in sin. We are, born in sin. We are living in sin. Disobedience is sin. Accepted all that. But let me explain it like this, the beginning of our salvation we are talking about. And that's why I want to say to you, this was my question because I am dealing with these youngsters, the next generation, the children, to whom if we have to express it effectively and make them understand, or to any of our colleagues or friends or anywhere, anyone, you know, this has helped me to understand the concept of the sinner or the beginning of our salvation, the need of salvation. Now you say, when God created man in the garden of Eden, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, we read like this, that God form, formed a man out of the dust of the earth, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. A man became living soul. So in that one verse, Genesis 2, 7, we find man is a tripartite being. Man has a body, man has a soul, man has a spirit. And that's why because man is a tripartite being and having the spirit element in him, which God has breathed into his nostril, you and I are said to be created in the image of God. Why that? Because like this. Because we have a body, we become world conscious. Because we have body, we are able to touch, we are able to lift, we are able to see, we are able to walk, we are able to talk. Because of body, we are world conscious. But because of soul, we are self-conscious. Now you are looking at me, I am looking at you, I am talking, you are listening. And at the same time, you are talking with yourself. 
what this fellow is trying to tell us, what is that going on? Yeah, you're talking to yourself, which I do not know, but you know it. You're talking, you know, that things are going on within you. Okay, that is our soul, which makes us of our self-consciousness. Because of body, I'm world conscious. Because of soul, I'm self-conscious. And because of spirit, and only spirit, we are God conscious. Now man is made with these three elements, body, soul, spirit, world conscious, self-conscious, and God conscious, okay? Now God said to man, after chapter, Genesis chapter two, verse seven, we come to verse 15 and 16, and God said to man, well, you can eat of any fruit of the tree of the garden, but thou shalt not eat of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, the day you shall eat, you will surely die. My question is, did Adam and Eve eat that fruit? Did they eat? Yeah. Did they eat? I thought it will be, yeah, louder, yeah. <laughs> they ate the fruit, no doubt. They disobeyed God, yeah? They ate the fruit, they disobeyed God. Did Adam die physically? Yeah, right away. Did Adam die as God said? You will surely he die. Separated from God. I mean, no. he, he was kicked out from the garden. So. That's fine. My question is, die, did Adam die right away? No. Spiritually, no. did. Physically, did he die physically? No. 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 How many years did he live? Nine hundred and thirty years. Then what God said was wrong. No. If at all he has disobeyed, and God said the day you shall eat, you will die. That means absolutely. No connection with God, you will die, you will be removed. The wrath of God, the condemnation of God, the punishment of God, all should come upon you, no relationship with you. I, I felt the man should have been dead at that moment. God had all right to do that. But Adam lived for 930 years. My question is, what God said, was it wrong? No. Absolutely not. If what God said is not wrong, then what has happened to this man? Because, as you said rightly, God told him, you have disobeyed. God, as usual, came now to the garden. And Adam, every time, had been meeting God, communing with God, communicating with God. But this evening, something wrong. What has happened? God has come there, and man is not there. Where is he? He is hiding. Why? Why is he hiding? Because he has known that he has done something which is against the will, mind, purpose, and commandment of God. And he's found behind the bushes. Why? Very simple reason. Let me tell you like this. Without making it a long class, let me draw it to a very simple understanding for all of us. You see, if this is what man is, and this is what body, soul, and spirit is, this is how man is created. But man has disobeyed God and he has sinned against God. Because of body, we are world conscious. Because of soul, we are self conscious. Because of spirit, we are God conscious. But now this man, he has committed sin against God and that's why his spirit is suppressed. That spirit is no more active. With that, he is not able to really communicate with God and that's why he is hiding behind it. What has happened into his life is this, that in the seat of his heart, Instead of God ruling there, now it is his soul ruling there. I, me, my. That's what is happening with every person to whom we can call a sinner is because their body or their members of body, whether it is eyes or thinking or hearing or speaking or working out, what man has done when he disobeyed God? Actually, he saw the fruit. Well, he reached to the fruit. He stretched hand to the fruit, he plucked the fruit, he ate the fruit, and he disobeyed God. And all that can be summed up in three words, according to the Bible. That sin is put into three words. What, is, what are those three words? Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. When man committed that sin in the seat of his heart, 
it was not God and God's commandment and God's rule, but now his soul was ruling on him and his members of body were doing all that I like, I do. I like, I see. I like, I will do. Nobody can stop me. And that's what people of this world are controlled by. You and I also were the same people. Spirit is suppressed. The spirit is not in control. And that's why Adam did not die immediately physically, but he died immediately that very moment spiritually and his relationship with God was broken. Because with spirit only, one is becoming God conscious and that God consciousness, God communication, God reconciliation or God relation was broken in him. Spirit is suppressed, soul has become active, I, me, mine. I like, I will see, I like, I will eat, I like, I will do. That's what man is ruling with his soulish life. And his body, the members of his body with, with head or eyes or tongue or ear or tongue, whatever it may be, it is all controlled by me, I. And that's why man is known to be a sinner. And this sin by one man entered this sin into the world and since we are born to them, the same sin nature has come to each one of us. That is the beautiful definition of understanding of a sinner. But now what happens is, when we live in this world, there is another definition in this world. And what they, whom they call sinner? The world says, the definition of a sinner in the world is, he or she, whosoever does the acts of sin are sinner. If you do the acts of sin, you are a sinner. If you tell lie, you are a sinner. You have sinned against God. If you steal, you have sinned against God. If you do this, do that, which is not right, you are sinning against God. If you do the activities of sin, you are a sinner. That's what the world says, you know. And that's why the world has all teaching for it. What? Don't tell lie. Don't steal. Don't eat that. Don't see that. You know, all that thing trying to control from the childhood. Did you hear any time the parents telling to the child, hey, Vita, you should tell lie, that's very good. <laughs> or did you hear any time in the school, they are teaching to them uh, how to go on for stealing? No. Why? At home or in school or in religious places, wherever people go or children go or whosoever goes, they teach to abstain from sin. Why? Because Committing acts of sin, they say you will become a sinner. That's the definition of the world. But I like the definition of the Bible. And it is just the reverse. You take any subject, you know, the definition of the world and definition of the Bible, it is just the reverse. If the Bi Bible says God is love, did you see in India sometimes at the back of the truck, they will write, you know what, love is God. It is all reverse every time. But when you think of this definition, those who commit acts of sin are sinners, says the world. But Bible says, because we are sinners, we commit the acts of sin. Because there is a root of sin inside me, I am liable to automatically, I am sold to sin. I will see it, what I should not. I will think what I should not. I will eat and drink and do and go what I should not. That's what man's life is. Because we have sin in us, we are committing the acts of sin. Let me explain that sin aspect of man and that's how he is being inherited by every person in this world. Now, I'm always surprised. What did the Lord Jesus Christ say to the disciples before going out from this world? As he was ascending up the last communication, the disciples were then the Lord was talking to them. And what did he say to them? Go into all the world and distribute the Bibles to them. No, no, no. What did he say? Go into all the world and give the crucifix to them. No. Go into all the world and baptize them. No. What did the Lord say? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. My question is, sinners like this are walking, living in this world whose spirit is suppressed, soul is active, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, I is ruling in the body, I'll do whatever I like, nobody has control over me. I am living like this in this world. And now what happens? Now the gospel of salvation is the only way that man can be saved. And that is the only tool which God has given. And the Lord said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. 
without hearing of the gospel there is no salvation now look at our verse ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13 how how do we read that ephesians 1:13 in him you also after listening to the message of truth in him also after the listening of the message of truth or the word of truth the gospel of your salvation fantastic the gospel of your salvation you having also believed you having also believed will wait there did you see that you efficiency remember this is what has happened to you the word of truth has come to you the gospel of salvation has come to you and you believed in that means what you know what does that gospel do in the when we think of the beginning of salvation what does that gospel do in your life and my life together with that i want to read one more verse hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 notice it very interesting Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 For the word of God is living and active Listen the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two edged sword and sharper than any two edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit and piercing now our elements as far as the soul and the spirit of both joints and marrow which is a part of our body and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart fantastic and able to judge the thoughts and intents of our heart now listen here this is what man's life is a sinner okay body soul and spirit spirit is suppressed soul is active ruling i me self whatever i want i will do this is how he is walking and living in this world suddenly he hears the message of the gospel it may be passing on a tract it may be hearing of a gospel it may be listening to a message or some way or other the word of truth the gospel of salvation you know when it is heard by a person like this this gospel or the word of truth comes to him or her as a double edged sword and what does that sword do it does only one work and what is that one work dissecting these three things one from the other that means we have read there and it is dividing asunder the soul the spirit and the joints and marrow which are the part of our body now in a life of a sinner these are all intermingled all mixed up and the soul is ruling there i do whatever i like sold to the lust of eyes and lust of the flesh and the pride of life but when the gospel comes as a double edged sword it does only work one work it separates the body from the soul and the soul from the spirit that's all that's what the work the word of god does when it separates that then the soul is able to judge the thoughts and intents of his heart because of the message of truth the gospel of salvation which he or she has heard because what they have heard and this division has taken place in their life now body is separate from soul and soul is separate from the spirit and now when these three elements are separate from one another he understanding the gospel comes to the self consciousness he knows his thoughts and intents of his heart which are not right which are wrong which are not god pleasing and that man when he comes to the realization of that he or she cries out with one sentence and what is that sentence lord forgive me a sinner that's what you have done one day that's what i have done one day when we heard that this is what happens to a person when he or she hears the gospel of the lord jesus the day when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation now you think of any of the individuals in the bible you know when they came to god or came in reconciliation with god or when they were related to the lord god you see the same thing has happened in their life for example this was a man he was a king he should have been in the battlefield but he didn't go there he remained in the palace his eyes went where it should not go he saw something which he should not see the lust of the eyes he had her in her in his palace lust of the flesh well he had the pride of life 
because I am king, I can do whatever I like. He got the man killed in the battle and had that woman for himself. He thought everything is fine with me. You know, I'm talking about whom? I'm talking about David. He thought I can get away with this. Nobody knows about it because God had mercy on him as God had mercy on you and me. God sent his man to his house, to his palace. And this man of God went, went to this king and he said with a parable, an example before him. And then the man of God had to point out because this king was angry and said, how can that rich man do like this to this poor man? The poor man's only goat is taken and being killed. The rich man had so many, but he did not take any of his. This poor man, he has looted like this. This rich man must be killed. Then Nathan said to him, you are that man. You are the man. David was shaken. The word of God came to him. He understood his sin. And what did he cry out? You know what did he cry out? That whole psalm is a beautiful psalm of this man. Psalm 51 I am talking about. Behold, Psalm 51 verse 5. Behold, in sin did my mother conceive me. And in sin did she give me a birth. In sin I was born. When did he understand that? Only when the word of God came to him. Only when he realized that. When the body from soul and soul from the spirit is separated, the word of God came to him and he cried out, Lord, I have sinned against you. I have sinned against you. What a penitent psalm that is. I thank God, you know, because what happened in the life of David at that moment, man like David could be then, later on, we know what he was called, man after God's own heart. Praise God for that. That gospel came to you, brother, sister, to me, to us, we know the day when it came to us in a different circumstances and different situation. But I want to talk about the beginning of this salvation. If we understand that, how good it will be to explain and to visualize the whole thing in this one verse. That is not the end of it. We have to take one step further. You see, this is my life, body, soul, spirit. But spirit is suppressed. I have sinned. Soul is ruling. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. I am living the way I like. The word of the truth comes. The gospel of salvation comes as a double-edged sword. It separates body from soul and soul from the spirit. And when these things are separated from one another, the soul comes to the consciousness and I cry out, I am a sinner. I have quoted only one example of David. You can turn to Luke's gospel chapter 5 and when that great catch was seen by this man up, Apostle Peter then, what did he cry out? He cried out and said, Lord, depart from me, a sinner. There was a big catch. He didn't catch the whole night. He should have said, Lord, when you come next time, come here, take my boat, use, preach, and then ask me to take little more inside and put my nets. Next time I will put nets. This time I have put only one net. But Lord, next time, whenever you come, tell me, use my net and boat and give me that big catch. He didn't say that. He said, Depart from me, a sinner. And the Lord said, From this on, day onward, I'll make you fishers of men. What a change it was, you know. Did you consider that any time? It's a beautiful passage, Luke 5. Simon, Peter, because you repented of your sin, you know, so far you were catching, fisher of men means what? So far you were catching the living fishers, and by the time you take them to the market, and for selling it, they are dead. So far you are catching the living and selling it as dead. But I am going to take you into the ministry after me where you are going to catch the dead ones, dead in their sins and trespasses. And when they look at me because of the preaching of the gospel, what they will happen? They will be brought to life. Yeah, fishers of men and fishermen. Fishermen is catching the live and seeing them dead. But fishers of men are having a greater ministry. What is that? Catching the dead ones and bringing them to the life in the Lord Jesus. I said about David. I said about Peter. You can think about the prodigal son, Luke 15. You can think about 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Think about Apostle Paul. He crying out and saying, I am the chiefest of all sinners. Actually, he was the chiefest of all learned men sitting at the feet of Gamaliel and learning things. But when the touch of the Lord came into his life, life was changed. And that's what has happened. A sinner's condition is this. The gospel of truth, the gospel of salvation comes. That's the work of dissection. 
soul comes to consciousness i cry out to be a repentant sinner the moment a person cries out i am a sinner that is the statement that we want that everybody should be drawn to i am a sinner the moment they cry out the next part of the verse takes place and what is that chapter 1 was 13 again when having having also believed you were sealed in him with the holy spirit of promise fantastic did you see that you heard the word of truth you heard the gospel of salvation it has done that work and it has shown the hearts and intents of your heart the thoughts and intents of your heart you repented and cried out that i am a sinner and after you believed you were sealed with the spirit of promise that means what when these things happen this thing is dire- dissected soul becomes a uh, conscious of sin and cries out and say god i am a sinner please forgive me the spirit of god comes and takes residence in my spirit or quickens my spirit makes my spirit alive regenerates me and the spirit of god comes and indwells me and i then become a child of god the state in which god created me body soul and spirit which was intermingled spirit was quenched put to uh, put off there no control over my soul was controlling over there but then after i come to the repentance and believe in the lord jesus i am brought back to not only that original state in which god has created me but now god has sealed me with the spirit of his promise even the holy spirit until the day of redemption which you will read in chapter 4 and verse 30 of the same epistle ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 30 until the day of redemption that means i am redeemed for now but until the spirit of god takes me and hands me over to the bride as a bride to the bridegroom to the lord jesus christ until that day of my actual redemption physical redemption to be taken to be with god forever and ever the spirit will carry me all the days of my life my brother my sister when i say about this beginning of salvation i really want that you and i not only to be understanding this fact but also making our children or to whomsoever we come across to understand how dangerous it is to remain in this state of sin because that will ultimately will lead to condemnation and judgment of god and there is absolutely no other way than the gospel we don't have to make make them to see a movie or make them to see a drama to have some influence over them about believing in the lord jesus absolutely nothing just the broken words of gospel even if we are not able to communicate the word of god as a double edged sword when they hear this work is done in their life spirit of god after the repentant prayer will come and reside in them and we are born again we become a child of god as many as have the spirit of god they are the sons of god shall we not thank god for such a salvation that he has given to you and to me what do you mean by that that means apostle paul says in first corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 there is first category which we see in genesis that is natural man yeah natural man understands not the things of god they are foolishness to him come on what are you talking god there is no god yeah enjoy your life eat what you like drink what you like go wherever you like natural man doesn't understand the things of god they are foolishness to him but look at verse 15 but the spiritual man you and i because we are sealed with the spirit of god our spirit is quickened now we are brought back to that god consciousness we know there is sin around us there is sin sinful flesh in which we are living in in the sinful world and sinful flesh but we have the spirit of god inside us which makes us to live a saved life of a child of god and that's what god is looking for when he says a saved person he looks in your life and my life a spiritual man a spiritual woman who are led by the spirit of god filled by the spirit of god adorned by the spirit of god until we are presented to the lord jesus christ the spirit is working in us when we read the bible you know this is inspired by the spirit of god the spirit of god will write these things in our heart he will cleanse us he will sanctify us he will prepare us as eliezer was taking rebecca that's a beautiful illustration in the scripture what a what a example that we have 
So the Spirit of God does the same work today in your life and my life. And that's why I want to talk about the second aspect. Not only the beginning of our salvation, which is so great, which nobody else can do. That's why Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And this is not your doing. Nobody can be saved by good works, good acting, good any of these good things that one can do. You are saved by the grace of God. We are saved by the mercy of God in our life. For by grace are we saved through faith in Christ Jesus. And what? how much shall we thank God for the salvation? This is the salvation which you and I really need to understand in a state which God has brought us in. But then look at the beauty of salvation. I will not drag the subject for long. But think of the beauty of salvation. Think of the blessings of salvation. The beauty and blessings, if you really want to know more of that I will just give a brief outline maybe you can just note down and you can study for yourself later on I'll when you turn to Hebrews chapter 2 book book of Hebrews chapter 2 and we read in verse 3 like this Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3 the writer of Hebrews says to the readers very important aspect of salvation chapter 2 and verse 3 it says there, how shall we escape? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Yeah. Then there are four things mentioned there. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3. He is calling there salvation as so great salvation. Why is this salvation so great? If you really want to study and know about it, let me give you seven metaphors. Just write down. Maybe we will not be able to explain that today. But just write down and for your reference. These seven metaphors will not only show you the beauty of our, of our salvation, but will also show you the blessings that we have in this salvation. Number one. Number one. Seven aspects of the so great salvation. Number one. The horn of salvation. The horn. H-O-R-N. The horn of salvation. Luke's gospel, chapter 1 and verse 69. Luke 1, 69. Write a cross-reference also. 1 Kings, chapter 1 and verse 50, 50. He is the horn of salvation. Praise God, for he has raised for us a horn of salvation. It's a beautiful study in itself, okay? All these seven metaphors are seven each hour message but just keep it for your reference you can study and see the beauty because each of those bring blessings in Christ to us in this salvation number one the horn of salvation Luke 1 69 then secondly the rock of our salvation Psalm 95 and verse 1 Psalm 95 verse 1 the rock of our salvation you can write a cross reference there Psalm 78, verse 15 and 16. Psalm 95, 1 and also 78, 15 and 16. Thirdly, the horn of salvation, the rock of salvation. Thirdly, the cup of salvation, the cup of salvation. Psalm 116 and verse 13. Psalm 116, verse 13. Write one more reference next to that. John 18 and 11. John 18, 11. You know, remember there in the garden when those people came to catch the Lord Jesus and take him, arrest him. Peter got angry. He took out his sword and wanted to chop the head of a soldier. And the Lord shouted at him and said, Simon, put back your sword in your sheath. Don't you want me to drink the cup my father has given to me? The cup of our salvation. He drank that bitter cup that you and I may have the sweeter cup. The horn of salvation, the rock of salvation, the cup of salvation. Fourthly, the tower of salvation. T-O-W-E-R. Tower of salvation. Proverbs 18 and verse 10. Proverbs 18, 10. Fifthly, the wells of salvation. Wells of salvation. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3. Isaiah 12, 3. Write a cross-reference. Jeremiah 2, 13. 
ഐസയ ട്വൽവ് ത്രീ ജെറമായ ടു തേർട്ടീൻ ഐ സെഡ് ഫൈവ് ബൈ നൗ ദ ഹോൺ ഓഫ് സാൽവേഷൻ ദ റോക്ക് ഓഫ് സാൽവേഷൻ ദ കപ്പ് ഓഫ് സാൽവേഷൻ ദ ടവർ ഓഫ് സാൽവേഷൻ ദ വെൽസ് ഓഫ് സാൽവേഷൻ ആൻഡ് ദെൻ സിക്സ്ത്ലി യു ഹാവ് ദ റോബ് ഓഫ് സാൽവേഷൻ റോബ് ആർ ഒ ബി ഇ ഓഫ് സാൽവേഷൻ ഐസയ സിക്സ്റ്റി വൺ ടെൻ ഐസയ സിക്സ്റ്റി വൺ ടെൻ and then finally you have the burning lamp of salvation isaiah 62 verses 1 through 6 burning lamp of salvation l a m p 62 1 to 6 burning lamp of salvation i said seven things the horn of salvation the rock of salvation the cup of salvation the tower of salvation the wells of salvation the robe of salvation the burning lamp of salvation and i tell you each of this is so beautiful if you are able to follow hindi you can go to youtube and type there jeevan jal tv j e e v a n ജീവൻ ജെ ഇ ഇ വി എ എൻ ജെ എ എൽ ടി വി ജീവൻ ജൽ ടി വി വെൻ യു ടൈപ്പ് ദാറ്റ് ദീസ് ആർ ദി മെസ്സേജസ് ഗിവൻ ഓൺ ദി ടെലിവിഷൻ ബ്രോഡ്കാസ്റ്റ് ബാക്ക് ഹോം ഇറ്റ്സ് എ ട്വൻറ്റി മിനിറ്റ് മെസ്സേജ് ബട്ട് ഈച്ച് ടൈം എ ബ്യൂട്ടിഫുൾ ന്യൂ ആസ്പെക്ട് ഓഫ് സാൽവേഷൻ ഇസ് ബീങ് ടച്ച് ദർ ആൻഡ് ദ ഗോസ്പൽ ഈസ് അറ്റാച്ച് ടു ദാറ്റ് സോ യു റിയലി എൻജോയ് ദിസ് ബ്രോഡ്കാസ്റ്റ് along with that the other seven things are also mentioned there the speciality of our salvation and what is the next one characteristics the characteristics of our salvation again these are 14 messages this also will come on the youtube after they broadcast there they upload on the youtube also you will enjoy all of these messages these are all beautiful study about our salvation my brother my sister may i at least draw your attention to one metaphor out of all let me draw your attention to one and then we'll close in prayer and go from here he is the rock of our salvation what a rock namade rakshade para what a rock he was why it is said to be rock of salvation because there were two incidents in the life of the people of israel we read in exodus 17 and numbers 20 that's why i gave you the cross reference psalm 78 verse 15 and 16 it is very interesting when you study that psalm 78 verse 15 refers to exodus 17 incident but psalm 78 and verse 16 refers to numbers 20 incident i'll repeat it psalm 78 verse 15 and 16 referring to two incidents in the wilderness journey exodus 17 verse 15 and then exodus uh, numbers 20 when you read psalm 78 and verse 16 how do we know that when you read these two verses little carefully you will see in verse 15 and he brought forth water out of the great depths for them the water first of all came out from the depths that speaks about exodus 17 experience moses what's in your hand the rod what's in front of you the rock take the rod and smite the rock when he smote that water came out that speaks about the bedrock psalm 78 verse 15 that refers to the death of the lord jesus once and for all on the cross of calvary and the word for rock used there is sur t s u r the word is different then when you come to verse 16 of psalm 78 it is referring to numbers 20 even after having a great experience in exodus 17 again when there was no water and they cried out and said did you bring us here to die our children are dying our cattle are perishing did you bring us to die moses was very much angry by now with this people he went to god and god said moses what's in your hand he said rod what's in front of you the rock take the rod in your hand but this time god said speak to the rock speak to the rock 
and that's why Psalm 78 and verse 16 is referring to that rock out of whom the waters flow down like a river. It is an exalted rock and the word in the original use there is not Sur this time but it is Sila that speaks about the not only the resurrection of the Lord Jesus but the glorification of the Lord Jesus. These were the two pictures meant any incident in the Bible meant to bring some pictures of the Lord Jesus before the people. But Moses has marred that picture of exalted Christ. It was needed only to speak to the rock and water would have come out. I am always surprised. Moses had to bear the consequence of that. He did not enter into the land of Canaan. But I am surprised. Huh? Yeah, One is Mara, other is Mariba. But you know what happened? I am surprised. What a loving God we have. He marred that picture and he smote that rock twice instead of speaking to that rock. But God, in spite of that, in spite of what he did, allowed the water to flow out of that rock and quench the thirst of these people. Such a loving God we have. Amen. What a loving God we have. Usually I say in Hindi like this. Uddhar ki chattan hai Prabhu Yeshu Uddhar ki chattan hai Prabhu Yeshu Nirash na ho he rahi Uddhar ki chattan hai Prabhu Yeshu Nirash na ho he rahi Nirbal ko bal deta Prabhu Yeshu Nirash na ho he rahi don't be discouraged, my brother, my sister. Today he is exalted. You can just speak to him and he will meet every needs of our heart. He is the rock of our salvation. Apostle Paul picks up this metaphor when writing to church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, he says to them, So many of you have come out. Cross the Red Sea. Salvation, baptism, brought under the cloud. Pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. The rock that was before you was Christ. But verse 5 he says, But with many of them, God was not well pleased. Why? From verse 6 onward, he gives the reasons there. And he says, All that happened to them was an ensample for us, that we should not lust as they lusted. We should not question as they questioned God. We should not go warring after other gods as they went warring after other gods. You should not be complaining and grumbling as they were complaining and grumbling. Oh, how beautiful salvation God has given to us. Let's really thank God and live out this life for the glory of God, for the little time that you and I have in this world. What a salvation, the beginning of our salvation, the beauty of our salvation, the blessing of our salvation. And I wanted to conclude it with this word, God thought it. Christ Jesus bought it, the Holy Spirit wrought it, the Bible taught it, faith brought it, the devil fought it, but thank God, I have got it. Praise God for that salvation which God has given to you and me. Shall we close in a word of prayer? Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful to you for your mercies upon sinners like us. So great salvation. We just cannot comprehend such a rich epistle of Ephesians that we have before us. One verse but puts all picture. Help us Lord not to be living in our old life, not following after the carnal ways, but knowing the great work of redemption in our life. The spirit which is quickened, the spirit of God with whom we are sealed with. May we be spiritual men and women, knowing the beginning of our salvation and what God has done and only God can do that and you did it in my life you did it in our life we are thankful to you help us to see the beauty of that salvation and enjoy the blessings of that salvation we praise you God we thank you bless each one of us until we meet again may the Lord undertake for all our needs giving you all glory and honor we ask this prayer in the name of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ Amen